Welcome to Washington in Focus, your source for the week's top stories in the state of Washington. I'm Cole Lauterbach, Managing Editor for the Center Square Newswire Service. This week, we'll be discussing state lawmakers hesitating to consider a ballot measure to roll back a limit on police pursuits. Uber and DoorDash drivers and other app-based workers in Seattle now pulling in more money per hour and how much it's costing consumers. A wait-and-see game on new initiatives in Olympia and a potential tripling of income tax limits across the state. That's ahead on Washington in Focus. I'm Cole Lauterbach. Are you tired of news that puts politics over people? At the nonprofit Franklin News Foundation, we believe in putting people over politics by delivering nonpartisan news and audio content that serves you, the American taxpayer. With Franklin News Foundation, you can read fact based, state focused news for free at thecentersquare.com. You can listen to civil, balanced conversations between policy experts through our podcast network at americastalking.com. Or you can get in-depth news on K-12 education spending, curriculum, and school safety at chalkboardnews.com. It's all free through Franklin, where we put you, the American taxpayer, first in every story, episode, and conversation. And it's only possible through our supporters. Together, we can produce content that puts people over politics and brings Americans the news they deserve. Become a supporter today at franklinnews.org slash donate. Once again, that's franklinnews.org slash donate. Welcome back to Washington in Focus. I'm Cole Lauterbach. Now, let's jump into the headlines. The U.S. Supreme Court on Tuesday morning declined to hear an appeal of the Washington State Supreme Court ruling from March 2023 that found a statewide capital gains tax to be lawful. Washington editor Brett Davis covered the non-announcement. Brett, what's this mean for the state's controversial tax? Well, it means the tax is here to stay, at least for now, given the highest court in the nation has decided not to review the case. But as we'll discuss later, it's not necessarily the end of the story. Now, go back a step and just explain how this tax is applied, because it's not just a typical income tax, obviously. No, it's not. Uh, The capital gains tax is a 7% levy put on individuals' long-term capital gains exceeding $250,000. It would be things like the sale of stocks and bonds and so forth. Uh, The tax does not apply, however, to things like real estate, farms, and retirement accounts. Now, it's the unbalanced nature of that with the exemptions and such. That was part of that challenge, correct? Right. What's the rationale behind calling this tax on income from investments not an income tax? How does that work? Well, proponents contend the capital gains tax is an excise tax on a good or service and is not an income or property tax because it applies to sales on or sales or transfer of assets. Uh, the Washington State Supreme Court back in March of 2023 agreed when it ruled 7-2 to that the capital gains tax is an excise tax and not a property tax, which the state constitution limits to 1% annually. Uh, the court also rejected the notion put forward that it's an income tax which the state Supreme Court, uh, state Supreme Court decisions going all the way back to the 1930s have repeatedly struck down uh, based on the state constitution's u- uniformity clause that does not allow income to be taxed at different rates. It is interesting to note that uh, in the appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court opponents of the capital gains tax, they sort of pivoted away from that strategy, from questioning the nature of the tax. And they, uh, they said it runs afoul of the uh, U.S. Constitution's Commerce Clause, you know, when applying gains earned from outside the state of Washington. So they, they pivoted a little bit, but it didn't seem to work as the, the court decided not to take the case. Hmm. Now, we've covered this in the past that this is more just kind of, a you know, inching your way into a potentially different tax um, where it would a it would there was there's a thought to tax wealth. Right. Right. Uh, overall wealth where you every year you have to say, all right, I'm worth this much as a Washington state resident and I've got, uh, you know, this much in overseas investments and this is how much all my property is worth. Uh, that would become potentially much more nebulous. Could you explain what that could entail and then right. what this means for supporters of taxing someone else's overall estate? So this actually came up last session. Uh, lawmakers they actually considered a built a, a wealth tax of one percent, excluding the first two hundred and fifty million dollars. <laughs> Not something I can relate to, but uh, derived from the ownership of stocks, bonds, and other financial assets. Now that bill didn't really go anywhere. But it's not just a wealth tax. Uh, certain Democrats have made no secret of the fact that they want to use this uh, capital gains tax as a means of trying to pass legislation setting up a general income tax in Washington. 
That was Senator Jamie Peterson uh, back in March of 2022. So about a year before the Washington Supreme Court made its ruling. I mean, he openly said in a meeting that he hoped the state Supreme Court would clear the way for an income tax in Washington. So, Well, and also, too, you have to think, obviously, you know, you and I are not going to be looking at $250 million of taxable income uh, right. any anytime, the, yeah, obviously, near future. But with what people don't understand about that is that many businesses file as pass-throughs. Meaning that it's, it's an income tax. Those are those are a lot of the higher earning individuals are actually it's business revenue. Right. And so when you're looking at something like that, it, these are small businesses that have to look into the future and say, well, that could be coming off of my, you know, you know, I, I, that could be my haircut coming up uh, when it comes to that. And I always wonder what kind of message that does send, um, especially considering that Washington is with the Seattle metro area being such a massive center for commerce and then the ports with import export companies. Now, even though this was ruled constitutional and then the Supreme Court decided that they would not entertain uh, affirming or overturning it, this could still go away this year, right? Right. So as I tease at the beginning of the segment, the fight over the capital gains tax continues. That's because in December, uh, voter advocacy group Let's Go Washington, they turned in a whopping 420,000 signatures for an initiative to the legislature that would repeal the capital gains tax. At the same time, they also turned in another uh, initiative that would prohibit income taxes at the city and county level. It may uh, turn out that voters will have the final say, depending on what the legislature does or doesn't do. Right. And the legislature has to, it's, uh, Washington is a little novel in that way where the, the initiative goes to the legislature to say, okay, you know, you have two choices here, but either way, this is either going to become reality or it's going to be, you know, potentially become reality. Right, they'll either pass yeah. it or if they don't, you know, it'll go to the, the ballot in November and they can also uh, put on a, you know, an alternate to that. Right. One more thing to look forward to in November. Speaking of the Seattle area, Uber and DoorDash drivers and other app based workers in Seattle are now pulling in more money, uh, not per hour, essentially, but pulling in more money per trip after a new ordinance went into effect on January 1st. They're also getting paid leave. Seattle reporter Spencer Pauly is here with this story. Spencer, both of these benefits aren't simply a higher hourly wage or a crude vacation day is like that of a you know a W-2 salaried or hourly employee. Mm-hmm. Can you explain how these two new ordinances work? Sure. So let me start with the app-based worker minimum payment ordinance. So this ordinance requires network companies like your DoorDash and Uber to pay the greater of a minimum per minute amount of 44 cents and a minimum per mile amount of 74 cents, or they have the option of paying a minimum per offer amount of $5. Now, these rates can increase in the following years, starting in 2025, and these increases will be based on an annual inflation or standard mileage rate adjustments. Uh, the other ordinance, the app-based worker paid sick and safe time ordinance, allows app-based workers to accrue one day of paid sick and safe time for every 30 days. They work at least one stop in Seattle city limits. Holy cow. That's complicated. Mm-hmm. Yes, All right. It is. Uh, that is, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of the equation that has to be done uh, with all of this, that seems like an incredible lift for the, pardon the pun, for them to try and enforce something like this. Now, did Uber and the rest have any estimation as to how this would affect the businesses that use their services? Because I'm going to, you know, I'm, I've, it, having been in Seattle a couple of times, I'd never used uh, you know, like say Instacart or uh, I've grabbed a couple of Ubers and they were not cheap already. Mm-mm. Do you see this? I mean, did have they prognosticated that this is going to be something that becomes much more expensive of a service? Absolutely. So for businesses alone, Seattle, they are going to lose up to $74 million per year as a result of these new laws. That's based on uh, DoorDash's estimates. Uh, this is because they are going to increase pay. Following the story I wrote up, DoorDash announced that they are implementing regulatory response fees to balance out the costs that are associated with these new laws. Um, these are already into effect. So when now that people are going to use DoorDash or Uber or anything like that, they're going to see these fees added to that to kind of get past that uh, DoorDash got rid of its suggested tip rate. So now 
its drivers are going to see perhaps less tip money, but that's because of these new laws. Uh, so the suggested tip, which is ubiquitous on these, it's almost become something of a meme at this point because mm-hmm. it's like, you know, you bring me a sandwich at, a, at the restaurant, you know, at some place. And, you know, even if it's not that vital of a service, if you're just picking up a to go order, they're asking for a tip um, and it's become a bit of a joke. But now you're saying that Uber's and this is just in Seattle. They've gotten rid of the suggested tip option because they're already being paid more. Yes, that is correct. This is based off a announcement that they they put out the day that this ordinance went into effect on Saturday. I almost wonder if that could end up with these Uber drivers getting less compensation because the tips went solely to them. Right. Whereas the cost of the actual drive was divvied up, um, obviously, another pun. But uh, in terms of... Uber, the city tax, all sorts of different places taking their cut. But that tip was solely for the driver. And that then becomes a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how the reaction is going to become from these drivers. That will be something to look out for. I already know that consumers were already worried that they would see their fees continue to increase, which they have because of this. But now it's going to be something to look at in the future to see if these delivery drivers are going to be like, no, wait, this is a bad idea because now I'm making less money than I was going to make before. Now, DoorDash estimated before that their drivers were making about $28 per hour and about 90% of their delivery drivers were working less than 10 hours a week. Um, So it seems like this is probably going to boost up their hourly wages uh, in regards to that, unless Mm. more less people start using DoorDash and these services. That's just where I was going. Uh, you know, the law of economics is that as something becomes much more expensive, uh, if it's all of a sudden becomes out of reach and no longer is considered an affordable option, uh, you know, people are going to go back to, you know, cabs. Uh, they're going to go. I mean, it's, walk over it, and grab it. You know, absolutely. Right. Uh, this is going to all of a sudden that maybe it becomes no longer justifiable to have your food delivered to you. Instead, you're, you know, because everything in Seattle's a short walk away, even if it's freezing cold out there, maybe it becomes worth it. And they may be testing that limit of just what consumers will shoulder. Speaking of shouldering burdens, this also you talked about this wild new um, way of measuring how much they're compensated now, there was also an estimate estimate of how much this is also going to cost the taxpayer to fulfill, right? So, yeah, basically, the city has to add FTEs to basically enforce these new laws. Um, and they're also campaigning advertisements uh, promoting this for their app-based workers. Um, based off of fiscal notes I've seen, uh, it will cost 115000 implement implementation costs and $148,000 in ongoing annual costs f- towards this. This is based off of the paid sick leave ordinance. Looking deeper into this, I found out that the enforcement of the minimum payment ordinance will cost about $527,000 in 2024 just to cover three FTEs. Wow. They want to enforce these laws, and to do that, they need to hire more people. And these yeah. people, it looks like they're making a pretty good salary from this. So. Well, yeah. I mean, better than the Uber drivers, presumably. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> Moving back to Olympia, hundreds of thousands of Washington voters signed petitions to repeal the police pursuit law, limiting when law enforcement can chase a suspect. The initiative, now certified, state lawmakers are to consider it. Joining me from Olympia is Capitol reporter Carlene Johnson. Carlene, has there been any movement on this initiative getting its day? Sadly, not at this point at all. Representative uh, Chris Corey out of Yakima uh, told me earlier this week, he's like, you know, we've got an obligation to listen to what the people of the state are asking us to do. We need to get a hearing scheduled. Democrats are in charge of that, of course, because they are in large majorities in both the House and Senate here. Um, But the measure has been certified yet like 4,000 plus people that signed this initiative and they're not just Republicans. It's not a partisan issue. You've got uh, more Democrats and independents in the majority, about 54% overall signing those petitions because people are are fed up with crime in their communities. So at this point, nothing's scheduled. Hmm. 
Now, what walk us back and explain what the initial law limited. Initially, it limited and it was slightly amended in 2023, as we know, to uh, allow reasonable suspicion of a crime uh, as a reason that an officer could pursue. Um, but prior to that, back in 2021, it said any peace officer could may not engage in a vehicular pursuit unless there's reasonable suspicion to believe the person in the car has committed or is in the process of committing a crime, a violent sex offense, a vehicular assault offense, um, other types of assault. They know the person's escaping, someone that's a DUI, um, or the person poses a serious risk of harm to others in the, uh, and, and safety. But otherwise, a guy just like pulling out of a store parking lot, you believe he ripped some stuff off or may have may have hurt somebody in the store, whatever. They can't pursue. They don't pursue. And in many cases, they just don't even show up when 911 is called. Right. Now, in terms of this, you find yourself at a point where common sense has to start getting called into question with something like this. Uh, what was the argument for limiting these police chases? Because in terms of the way you just described it, I, I feel like a you know somebody that hears this and says that sounds pretty wild. Um, it, can you go back in time for me and give the reasoning behind wanting to limit police pursuing suspects? Well, there have been incidents. Uh, they're always high profile and make the news of, you know, police pursuing a suspect and, uh, you know, somebody gets hurt, somebody gets killed, a bad accident results, and there are people that are injured. We had the um, incident in Kent, uh, probably it's been a few years now, where an officer was putting out spike strips and because of a pursuit that was going on, he ended up being hit and killed. So there are those incidents, but it's not like it's happening all the time. But the argument has been it endangers the public and we need to save lives and prevent police from these unnecessary quotes around that uh, mm. chases. But things have backfired, as we all see in our communities. And you've got every law enforcement agency across this state pleading for some changes again to allow them to go after the bad guys. Now, we've seen you, you mentioned that and then police have described this and we've seen police video of uh, people running from law enforcement and, and, you know, openly saying, listen, you can't chase me. I know the law, um, it, you know, describe some of the fallout that we've seen where police have been absolutely hamstrung in cases that should be very straightforward. Absolutely. And you know, we've got obviously police shortages, right? Who wants to come to work for a police agency in Washington state when, you know, the uh, it's not a respectable choice of a career uh, anymore because it, they've been demonized. It started yeah, with the defund police, movement. Police right? have said that, right? Police, police have said that. Yes. Um, I talked to an officer when uh, I was here in Olympia a couple of a couple of uh, days ago and a state trooper they're always you know guarding the capitol grounds and uh, i said to him i said are you guys recruiting numbers coming up at all he said not really he said sadly i wouldn't want to tell my own kid or any other loved one i have uh, that this is a good time you know to join the profession he said i paid well but i'm close to retirement i wouldn't yeah. want somebody coming up with the restrictions they have on them now um but then we see it in our own little communities, right? I watched a 7-Eleven in my town in Federal Way where I live this week. And obviously, drug-influenced guy was trying to push a shopping cart into the 7-Eleven. The clerk comes around with a baseball bat, confronts the guy, posted up like he was going to take a swing. That would oh, not have oh, ended oh no. well. Uh, and I asked the clerk, I sat in my car and watched this with the doors locked. A couple of minutes later, went in and I I asked the clerk, I'm like, does that happen a lot? He said, you know, every single day. And without me asking, he said, you know, we call police. They don't come. Yeah, heartbreaking. As, a, as a, it is heartbreaking. As a kid, I you know worked at a gas station in, in my rural, small, it's not even a town. It was a village. And my parents were, you know, at the time, they were nervous. They, they said, you know, you're there until late hours at night. You're running in the cash register and there's people that come in that might rob the place or something like that in terms of what 
they're seeing now and the the instance that you explained with this uh you know this guy trying to just break into the place and run the you know shopping cart into it i probably would have listened to him uh back then if it was the same case now i mean it sounds i don't want to sound like an old crank but at the same time feels like it's a totally different environment at this point and, and by limiting law enforcement from allowing to pursue a suspect that under previous circumstances they know that this is a person to be arrested i i feel like that only enables and, and can worsen that problem and then you've got so many stores that have shut down closed up right, right. you can't you can't blame the store owners for wanting to protect their employees um you know, and I, the way things are going for many of these uh, clerks in these convenience stores, especially a baseball bat isn't going to be enough. Well, uh, thank you, Carlene. I appreciate it. Uh, now, another measure in Olympia would actually triple a homeowner's property taxes. Currently, Washington state limits its property tax increases to 1%. This new bill would increase the cap potentially to 3% of an increase annually. Eastern Washington reporter Randy Brock reported on this story. Randy, what's the reasoning behind wanting to allow such an increase to take place every year? Well, in all, there's 20 Democrats who are sponsoring Senate Bill 5770, which, as you said, calls for lifting the state's property tax levy lid from the current 1% annually to a proposed 3% a year. Uh, why, you ask? Uh, the bill sponsors are crying poor. They say the current 1% cap severely inhibits the state, along with its counties, its cities, and other special taxing districts to fund critical community services as as populations and inflation continue to rise. Now, property taxes are kind of the main revenue source for counties and cities to pay for cops and criminal justice costs, while the state share goes to public schools. Uh, sponsors of the bill say that raising the annual limit will help these local jurisdictions pay for public safety and help the state boost education funding, especially for students with disabilities. Now, this uh, we've we've seen uh, backlash to this already. Uh, who are the critics? Probably anyone who doesn't want to see their property tax increases triple every year. But uh, 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 Senate Republican Caucus leader John Braun of Centralia, he's kind of been trying to rally the opposition. He's been speaking out against the proposal, which was scheduled for a public hearing Thursday afternoon by the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Braun, who serves on that committee, says the effects of of the measure would hit a lot of people, seniors on fixed incomes, middle class families trying to afford higher prices on gas and groceries, a higher property taxes translate into higher housing costs for homeowners and renters alike. So he's questioning how Democrats can say they want to provide affordable housing while making housing more expensive for everyone. Braun also says that Democrats' concern for public safety seems kind of hollow, given how their policies have gutted police departments. Some people talk about trying to defund the police and uh, that providing services for school kids with disabilities should not depend on a new tax. Right. When, um, whenever we hear a local government official cry poor or talk about any type of revenue shortage, the first thing to get cut is police, the second fire, the third is your local school district's supplies. This will definitely be something that we will track as it works its way through the Capitol in Olympia. Thank you, Randy. And uh, thanks to all of our journalists for sharing their stories. Stay up to date with all of these and more at thecentersquare.com. I'm Cole Lauterbach. And until next time, this has been Washington in Focus.